Well, open up the Bible this morning. We are in, still in the book of 1 Peter. That is the series that we're in on aliens. And we have ventured now into chapter 3. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, we are talking about marriage. Now, don't tune me out if you're here and you're not married, right? I'm going to show you why in just a moment um, as, we, as we dive into this. So again, you know, for years I have taught uh, this passage and most predominantly um, when I do premarital counseling, this is the very first session that I teach um, is this one. And it's never occurred to me right? This is what I love about the Bible. It has never occurred to me until this series that marriage was put in a survival kit on how to be an alien. Like it just, it never dawned on me. So stop and think about that in just a moment. We're working our way through a book that to to us is a book. It was a letter that was written, meant to be distributed to the churches who are now dispersed, getting ready to face persecution, Now frame that, right? Keep that in your mind. And with that, Peter felt so inclined and led by the Holy Spirit of God to write on how to maintain a godly marriage. Listen, this is so significant in the times that we live in, not just now, but from the moment that Adam and Eve were God's first children and became the very first married couple, the most attacked chapters in the Bible are Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2. If you can denounce there is a God, if you can denounce that he created everything, and if you can denounce that there is a marriage union between a husband and a wife and that it is a family, then you can begin to unravel everything else. That's why it is still consistently the most attacked chapters in all the Bible, which, by the way, tells you and I why there is a continued all-out attack on marriage and trying to redefine that. Because the enemy knows what God has already created is a very powerful demonstration to the rest of the world of what faithfulness, forgiveness, grace, covenant, commitment, fellowship, and absolute love should look like on this earth. In other words, that is what marriage does. Marriage is a living, walking, breathing example of the gospel. Think about that for just a moment. For many of us, when we get married, it's because he, him or her is very attractive and there's chemistry and we can see ourselves spending our lives together with that individual. And listen, we want that, So, right? So here's, here's what I began to tell folks in, in premarital counseling. I'm like, so let's get this straight right off the bat. Love is not the common denominator for marriage. Oh, thank you. All right. <laughs> Somebody needs to be in that class with me when I teach that. (laughs) Oh, that's the first. Uh, Because normally people are like, huh? But all right, somebody gets it. You'll help me out this morning. All right, so anyway, but I say that. Everybody's like, what? Wait, what, what does that mean? Well, in the scriptures, God clearly tells the husband to love the wife, but to the wife, he says to submit or respect. Love is not the common denominator, or he would have given the same advice to both. What is the common denominator? Commitment. That is, the, that is the common denominator. And is that not what our world needs to see more in the area of relationships, is commitment to one and one only? Is that not what our, our world needs to see, is what does it mean to be with someone? Uh, somebody asked me one time, they said, well, what do I do with all of his flaws? And I said, Um, The same thing you do with yours. Put up with them, right? We all come with flaws. Isn't that what the world needs to see is to see a couple living out faithfulness, grace, fellowship, forgiveness, union, literally. So here's what you need to understand. Love, commitment makes your love grow stronger. Love doesn't make your commitment. Love comes and goes. Love is an emotion. Love is a feeling. If you've been married any amount of time, you know that, right? Right? I mean, we know that. So what we're working on here is commitment and and a commitment toward an established covenant, an established relationship. So once you gather together here at church, of course, as individuals, we are called to go out and share, right? This is our gathering time. This is our Sabbath. This is when you and I sort of come away from and get unto God so we can go back out and be among and share and live, right? That, That we understand about Sunday morning. But it's not just you individually sharing. It's literally your marriage is a walking, living, breathing example 
of what does it mean to be the church, which is referred to as the bride of Christ, and Christ is referred to as the groom. What does it mean to be committed in a covenant relationship with God and demonstrate such powerful things, as I've said so many times, forgiveness, grace, fellowship, love, commitment, covenant. That is what our world needs to see, and it is best displayed in the context of marriage. Now, if you're here and you're like, well, I'm not married, or I previously was, or you know, whatever, whatever the case may be, you and I still can learn from it. We can point to. I'll sort of give you a hint this week, give you a head start. So this week, you're going to hear Pastor Rodney. The challenge is going to be that you and I are supposed to find somebody, a married couple that we looked up to, or maybe currently are looking up to, that is a model, that is an example to us in some facet of what does it mean to be a family, a husband, a mom, a dad, a wife, a marriage, and use that as an example of how they're helping you. That's a testimony. And a marriage is an example of just that. So, But I don't want you to tune out if you're not married, because yes, we're going to go right at marriages. But what I love about it is when he gets down to, say, verses 9 and 10, He kind of lumps all of us back in. So again, put this in your frame of mind. Peter is writing, and he's saying it's it's about to happen. Stay faithful to the gospel. And and last week, we talked, what does it mean to be faithful to the emperor, to to write leadership structures? And it's not just to the worldly leadership structures as you and I see them. It's also, how are you and I to be faithful in the area of marriage? And, And what does that even mean? And how is that a testimony to the world? And then we're going to skip two Sundays here in just a moment, skip two Sundays and go fast forward, and we're going to come to the church and leadership of the church, the three structures that God has given to demonstrate who he is through government, through marriage, and through the church. And so you and I need to learn some of these basic principles that he's teaching us here, married or not, all of us can learn some of these basic principles of what does it mean to live a life of commitment, aiming towards a covenant, so that you and I are a witness to the lost world that is around us. So let's talk about this. What happens when Mars meets Venus? (laughs) You know, how to have an out-of-this-world marriage. I mean, really, just the title alone tells you and I that that the, the, the Christian covenant that you and I make to stand before God and say, I'm here and you're here and together we're gonna grow to here, that alone is one of the most powerful, visible forces of the world of the gospel fleshed out. And you and I need to understand why this was put into what is referred to as a survival kit for end times, why God threw marriage in there. So let's look down at 1 Peter chapter 3 and begin at verse 7. We're going to go down to verse 9. 1 Peter chapter 3, look at verse 7. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel since they are heirs with you of the grace of life so that your prayers may not be hindered. Finally, all of you. See, here it is. This is all of us, right? So if you tune out for verse um, seven, you kind of have to get back in it in verse eight. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless for those, to this you were called that you may obtain a Blessing. All right, so let's talk about this. Well, how to, how to have an out of this world marriage. In other words, how to bring the two opposing kingdoms, which in some respects they are, right? How to bring those planets together for the good of the kingdom. The very first thing he says in verse seven, number one, the very first thing he says is you and I as, as married couples, we have to learn how to establish a dwelling together. You and I have to learn how to establish a dwelling together. He says, live with your wives in an understanding way. Now that word is better translated dwell. When you look at the word live, it literally means, it it means make a dwelling, right? So when we talk, when I talk to, when Rand and I talk to married couples, we are very easy and, and quick to say, look, you can have the same address. You can get bills at the same location and still not be a dwelling. You can sort of have somebody's last name. You can tell each other that we're married. This is my husband or my wife, but you're not actively working on establishing a dwelling together. So a little bit of secret into in sort of my upbringing, right? Um, my parents weren't, weren't perfect. No marriage is. Uh, but my dad, I love everywhere my dad went, Randall will tell you, everywhere we went, 
Before we went into a restaurant, my dad always said to my mom, you're going to be the prettiest woman in this restaurant. I just know it without a doubt. He still opened up the doors for her. And I mean, Raina was like, are you going to do that for me? I've miserably failed. I'll be honest with you. Not every restaurant have we gone into. Have I said that? I'm like, hey, what are you going to get? Right? Um, <laughs> oh, man. This is going to be fun. How much time do we have? I'm just being honest. Right? And, but I tried, right? I put together some flower arrangements yesterday. Did I not? We, so we're, we're doing good. We're do, yeah, thank you. All right, we're doing good. And not just because this sermon was coming up. I know that was your next thought, right? No, it's not. Been doing it for a while. But anyway, back to the sermon, right? You and I need to learn how to establish a dwelling together. So when I was growing up, um, they didn't have Home Depots and Lowe's. They had local hardware stores. My dad being in construction, we would go to the local hardware store. The local hardware store would call Seven Day Hardware. And that's where all the contractors would come in and get their supplies, right? We'd walk in and there was always this big pot belly stove in the back. And of course, any time of the year, but in the wintertime, all the, all the old guys in their overalls would be back there just shooting the breeze and drinking coffee. And without a doubt, every day, every day that I was in there, I'm like, do you not know you asked me that yesterday? Anyway, every day I would go in there and they'd grab a hold of their overalls and say, young man, like, yes, sir. how old are you? And I'm, well, I'm nine. Yeah, you look like you're 18. I'm like, wow, you know? And then they would go, are you married yet? And I'm like, no. And I'm like, this is the same question I get every time I went in there. I'm like, wow. Like these. But anyway, <laughs> this statement would always follow. Well, don't, because you can't understand a woman anyway. That's what was said. Until I came to the verse that we just read. Listen, likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an... So the Bible says you can't understand your wife. And the word likewise there is sort of a transitional word that means, that means basically this advice goes to just as much the husband as it does to the wife. And that's why that likewise is there. So in other words, both of you pay attention is sort of what that word means. So when the Bible says establish a dwelling together, what in the world does that mean? Very simply put, it means live in the same house with good common sense. Live in the same house with good common sense. In other words, just recognize that you're coming together. You are going to have different opinions. And I mean, just, just think of the miracle of marriage in itself. Yes, we are, we are attracted to each other for a while, right? And, and, and that's what sort of dominates it. You're still attracted, but now the attraction sort of is, takes a back seat to what we perceive as flaws or imperfections or things that really bug us now in marriage. And you're like, man, I thought I knew you, but... Didn't know that about you or, man, you really smack when you sleep at night and when are you ever going to cut your toenails, you know, kind of, a, right? I don't know. I mean, right? Just thinking of, think, picking on things. Now, if that's you, I didn't know that about you. I really didn't. <laughs> it, it just as a rule of thumb, like when I say stuff like that, don't look over at the spouse and go, yeah, that's you, <laughs> right? You know, anyway, um, but uh, live with good sense. Think of the miracle of marriage. That literally what a husband and wife are saying is I'm coming from somewhat different parental backgrounds and, and I have different expectations and different hopes and different desires and different emotions and personalities and you're trying to help me learn and, and, and each of you are heavenly sandpaper toward each other. You're given to complete each other, not compete against each other is what the book of Genesis tells us. And, and so when my wife is heavenly sandpaper against me to still to this day, nobody likes sandpaper on them. Right? Everybody likes to think they're a finished product rather than being told, well, you might could do better here, right? Well, nobody likes that, but yet the Bible is telling you and I to live in the same house with good sense. How do we do that? Let me practically walk you through how to do that, okay? Here's a little note about this. Husbands, you need to learn your wives, is what he's saying. And I, am, I tell every couple that I do premarital counseling with, the marriage license is not a license. It's actually a work permit. When you get married, you basically are saying he or she now becomes my greatest project. Not my golf game, not my sales game, not my workout game, not my video games, not any of that. Your greatest project now has become her. The Bible commands that, to live with them in an understanding way, meaning I need to understand her I need to begin to understand him. And by the way, when the Bible tells you and I to live with someone in an understanding way, you will be able to live with them in an understanding way if you commit to the biblical principles to do so. So with that, let's just note some differences, right? And in noting these differences, you and I should be able to 
help understand each other. First of all, you need to know this. The, the husband, first of all, is the initiator. The wife is the responder. Now, let me just say this and get this out of the way. And by the way, you can email Leah at mywaterstone.church if you don't like this comment. Let me, just, let me just get this out of the way right now, okay? Let me, just, let me just say this right now. A bossy wife is a failing husband. Right? Now, hang on. Let me, let me qualify that. So the wife isn't offended and so the husband's not, right? Let me qualify that. My wife is probably in many areas just as much a leader of our home, if not more of a leader in some areas. That's not what I mean. But I mean when the husband only plays video games and lays around the house and allows his wife to do it all, he's failed. You are called to be the spiritual leader of the home. So you are, by Genesis chapter 3, you have been given the responsibility to be the initiator. That doesn't mean you know it all. Probably my girls that come up here and testify and tell you that nine out of ten conversations, uh, I always defer to Raina. I'm like, all right, let's talk this out. What are your thoughts? Her gift of wisdom and her gift of discernment in so many areas far excels mine. So I trust more her discernment and wisdom in certain areas than mine. But Raina will quickly tell you that just as soon as she's making that decision, she never perceives it as like, she's now the boss of the family. She realizes this is what her and I are doing together in prayer, in partnership, in planning, and in communication. So I need you to understand that when I say that, all right? But guys, for the most part, you are the initiator. So what does that mean, I'm the initiator? Well, you may not know how to study the Bible, but you should at least say stuff like this. Hey, shouldn't we be in the word? You may not know how to pray or you may feel shy about praying, but you should at least say something like this. Can we pray together? That's what it means to be the initiator. It doesn't mean you understand it all. It doesn't mean you have a theology degree. It doesn't mean you have all the answers and you're all prepared when you come. It just means like, hey, we need to be thinking this way. We need to be praying this way. We need to be headed this way. And I need you to come alongside of me and help me understand that. According to Genesis chapter 3, what we call the curse, but really it's a redefinition of the roles there in Genesis chapter 3. Once Adam and Eve sort of sinned and they sat down with God and God said, here's how you're going to handle it and here's how you're going to handle it moving forward. The wife is built to be the responder. The the, the wife is built to be the responder. In other words, guys, as strong as your prayer life can be, only hers can be. Now, she may pray more than you, and I guarantee you she probably does, which is why you have more women in attendance in churches than men, which is why you have more women volunteering in church than men in in, in the average church. Because she's only at that point responding. But listen, she can't go that long without initiating something. So where you're not, she's going to try to fill in the gap. You need to understand that. But understand the roles. You, you, so what I'm saying, God, you don't, you don't always have to have the answers. But you ne- at least need to be the initiator that says, hey, I feel like we should pray. I think we should focus on this. I think emphasis should be placed here and, and, and join together in partnership. And trust me, the way she's wired, she will immediately respond to your initiation of that. Number two, if you didn't know this, wow, right? Men and women think differently, right? Hence the message when Mars meets Venus. Men think logically, women think emotionally. Now, hang on. Let me explain that. It has been proven. You can literally look at the, at the female brain even before birth. Has, the baby has been, uh, has been birthed during the development stages of a female brain and a male brain. The female brain is already making more connections to the left and the right brain than the man. So when I say emotionally, you don't, don't, don't interpret that as weaker than. Actually, it's stronger than. Most men can only think logically. Now, that's stereotypically. There are, there are a decent amount of men that can, both, can, can think both sides of the brain. And there are a decent amount of women that can only, as well, maybe think one side of the brain. It's, it's stereotypically speaking by the way we're designed. So I need you to understand that. So there are some men who can think logically and emotionally, some women who can only think logically, right? I mean, we, we, we get that. That's not saying everybody's like this. But by and large, men are more slotted to think logically. They're, 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 in other words, if you've ever had a conversation, most men approach in an argument like this. 
Well, number one, we'll do this. And number two, we'll do this. And number three, we'll do this. Conversation done, right? Like they immediately present the one, two, three. I've solved the problem. We're done. Move on. And by emotionally, I don't mean she's hysterical. She's now thinking of all the logic around it and all the reasons around it. Guys, I hate to say this, but we're like filing cabinets, right? We pull a drawer out, pull a file out, look at it, and we're like, all right, read that, done with it, and close the drawer. Women look at the whole filing cabinet at the same time. And all the files are like, well, yes, but it also affects this file and this file and this file. I'm like, whoa, 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 I just want to talk about just this file. That's what I mean. They have the ability to think more globally about a problem than most men. How many times have I come in and I've said, this is the answer, kind of a thing. And Rana's like, all right, I get that. But we also need to think here, and I'm like, oh. And we also need to think here, oh. And then, and then this, I'm like, ah. And if I was just looking at one file in the cabinet, right, it would not have been the complete answer, solution, or the path. That's why both are needed. So here's what you and I need to, to, to learn. We Guys, speaking specifically to guys, because women have the ability, because something moves over here, they can see how it affects the other part of the globe over here. We only see this one particle typically, right? Guys, when it comes to living with them in an understanding way, how you and I need to learn to think is we need to learn, listen to more what they mean rather than what they're saying. Now, if you're looking at me like a mule looking at a new gate, I get it, Right? <laughs> So when I was dating Raina, right, my mom growing up was considered to be the love doctor. That's what they called her. She, she taught all college girls, high school girls, uh, cheerleading teams. Like all the girls flocked to her for like dating advice. And I called my mom one day when I was dating Raina. I'm like, mom, this girl is confusing the mess out of me. I did. And, and I was like, I, she goes, she, and Sim, she goes, well, tell me what she's saying. Like, and I told her, she goes, Ron, you have to learn how to listen to what she means rather than just her words. And I was like, what does that mean? <laughs> right? But it's learning to read behind it, the emotion and the, t- the, the intention and the logic behind it, right? Of, uh, of, okay, well, what is she really trying to say here? How do I pull more of that out of her? What is she really? And I'm still learning that. We've been married 27 years, and I feel like I'm just now, honestly, I'm just now beginning to sort of get a handle on that. Having three daughters has greatly helped. <laughs> it's fast forward to that process quite a bit, right? But men think logically, women think emotion. Number three, men are challenged by doing. Women are more focused on being. Which is why, for an example, you will see more women, like right now, if we were to announce a man's Bible study and a women's Bible study, you would have women sign up for the Bible. Oh, I can't wait to dig into the Word. Oh, I can't wait to get questions and get around with you ladies. And guys are like, oh, that sounds horrible. (laughs) That sounds horrible. Like, just give me a task and let's talk about Scripture while we're banging a hammer, you know, or something. Like, let's just do something, right? Most guys think more about sort of being or doing Whereas women are more concerned about sort of being. Like, how is that going to affect here? How is that going to affect here and and there? And and so, guys, you and I have to learn to think more about being. Being together. Being in a situation. Thinking things through. Thinking. So, my my point is, guys, you can do this. Even wives. You can do this. You, You are called to understand each other The marriage license is not a license, it's a work permit. You are called to understand one another. And in that understanding, what you're doing is you're allowing God to complete you. You're allowing God to complete her. You're allowing God to complete the both of you so that you are a continual portrait of what the gospel message looks like. If you're out to dinner with another couple and they would never go to church, they should be able to see some semblance of what we call the gospel of Christ in how you talk, and how you treat, and how you respond to each other. That's why this week when we ask you to sort of point to, to a married couple that gave you inspiration and encouragement, I guarantee you those will be some of the traits that you mentioned. They will be gospel-like traits that attracted you to them, to that marriage as an example. Number four, learn this. Men are inward thinkers. Women are outward talkers. Boy, that still gets me to today. I'm like, just get to the point. I am like, just get to the bottom line. 
And no, they got to talk about everything, right? I mean, seriously, like I've learned with having girls, you know, Randall will ask me, how was your day? I'll give her like 15 words, you know, three points. You ask any of my girls, how was your day? Well, today I started out getting into my car. I opened up the car. I sat down in the chair. I backed out of the driveway. I noticed a squirrel, and there was a green bush that was there. And then I driving along the way. Oh, for the first time, I noticed that billboard, that sign. And by the time I, and I'm like, I just wanted to know how the day was. Like, we're not even out of the driveway yet. Is that not true? Is that not true? I mean, honestly, guys, okay, blow your wife's. Wait about three weeks, but blow your wife's mind. Next time they ask you how your day was, do that. I got up this morning and I look at the toast and the toast actually said this was a name brand and I picked this out and I picked this out and I opened up the refrigerator and I never knew we had that many condiments. And I was like, wow, just start talking. And they'll go, watch, watch it happen. But for the most part, men are more inward thinkers while the, while the, while the female is just going on and on and talking and it is important. Most of us are going, Now, believe it or not, we're processing, but we're processing a one, two, three, and we're, we're waiting to hear, oh, I can get with that, and we grab up, oh, oh, I got that. She said she wanted flowers, oh, I heard that, right? Like, and then we go, all right, I'm going to do this, and then we just kind of miss some of the important stuff sort of in between. It's the communication, so here's what you need to learn. How do we manage this? We need more thinking talkers and talking thinkers. Meaning, every once in a while, learn to switch roles. The guy learns to need, needs to learn how to talk more, and the female needs to learn how to think more instead of talk so much. All of us need to learn how to switch those roles. It's an awesome exercise to do. Trust me, for both of you, is, you know, they say that on average, on average, a, a male has about 150,000 words he speaks a day. Females have anywhere from 250 to 300,000 words a day. Females, on average, only use about half those words during their work day. So they've reserved another half. <laughs> you do the math. I'm serious. By the time she gets home, she still has 150,000 words, and he's used up all but 10,000. <laughs> and those 10,000 he wants reserved in his head when he's watching some movie and he's playing out a scenario. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, that's me, oh, yeah, right? He doesn't even want to be involved in any other conversation. But you have to learn how to work this out. So learn the differences. Establish, number one, a dwelling together. Number two, you have to learn how to create a valuable environment. Hear this. Now, the instruction is given more towards the man to the wife, but you and I both need to learn to create a valuable environment. The Bible says giving honor to the wife. That word honor means to put a crown on her head. Literally, your wife is the queen. Now, that also goes for the husband. It, it learns to sort of treat him like he's the king. That's what it means to respect. That's what it means to submit. So you and I are, are learning what it means to create a valuable, healthy environment. It, it's in how we communicate. It's in how we treat each other. It's in how we value and, and honor each other. How do you do that? Look in your notes. Number one, at least the guy to the girl. Look her in the eyes and talk to her about her beauty, her charm, and her grace. Now, notice we didn't start out talking about physical attributes, right? So in my office, on the bottom shelf of my desk, facing forward, um, is a picture of Raina when we were married in her bridal gown. And I, and I point to that, and I'm like, that was my wife when she was 25 years of age. And, and, and Raina knows this. I'm like, her and I both no longer look like we're 25, right? And so as we age, as we grow through marriage, she knows that if I look at her and I say, you're just as pretty as you were the day I married you, she knows what I mean, but practically she knows I'm really not. Like we've grown, we've aged, we've changed over time. So you don't only compliment the physical. You have to learn how to build a culture of value by talking about things like what makes her valuable and begin to speak that to your, in, front of your, in, your, in front of your children, in front of others about her patience, about her wisdom, about, about her discernment, about her decision-making ability. Learn to do that. It's not just flattery. It's learning how to complement her character, her nature, her patience, her, her spirit, her character. Why? Because one is corruptible and the other is incorruptible. Learn how to communicate both, right? Number two, listen to her words as well as her heart. Now, this goes for 
the wife as well. Learn how to listen to his words, but also learn how to hear what he's not said in his heart. Learn how to pull that out, right? Learn how to, number three, how do you do, how do you create an environment of value? Lift her as well as him, lift her up both privately and publicly. In other words, what you tell your wife behind closed doors, like I love you and I appreciate you, you should also say that publicly. You should also communicate that, trust me. Do it both. Learn how to do it. Create a value of of honor, right? The Bible says giving honor unto the wife, a valuable environment. Number three, learn how to carry the weight of the mission. So when, when you said, I do, you were saying, I do more to than we're gonna get bills at the same address and we're gonna sleep in the same bedroom and maybe have kiddos and do some of the same recreational things. You, at that moment, took on a covenant to be a mission, to be an example to the lost world of what faithfulness, forgiveness, grace, love, and acceptance looks like. That's your mission. Your mission isn't necessarily to establish a house with an address, to establish a certain level of income with kiddos, grandkids, whatever the state of life you might be in. It's so much more than that. Yours, as we're learning from the book of 1 Peter, is to be a missional example of those gospel attributes the world needs to see in relationships. So learn how to carry the weight of the mission. What do we mean by that? Well, the Bible here refers to the the wife as the weaker vessel. Now, this is one of those words that you just can't take from face value, right, as a guy and say, you're the weaker vessel. In two two instances um, in our marriage for Ron and Raina, Obviously, I can outpower physically rain at any moment. And because I'm a communicator, for the most part, I can out-argue, I can out-talk, I can out-wit Raina with my words because I'm more of a public communicator, public speaker. And so I have to be aware of that power, if you will, that I have and not wield it in her, on her, or over her. So, But here's what I've learned. As strong as I may be physically, I have learned that my wife is far stronger than me emotionally. My wife is far stronger than me in so many areas of character. Like just the fact alone that she carried three children. Listen, when I go to lunch and have a bad burrito or something, I can't take a bad burrito, much less carry something for nine months that's growing in me, right? Just what my wife did alone in the area of birthing three children deserves overwhelming respect. And I I look at her, I'm like, I couldn't have done that. I stumped my toe and I'm a big baby, Right, And she's just over here. I mean, in so many areas, my wife is so much stronger than I am. And she would come up here and say, and by the way, we're going to do a Bible study together. So you'll get to hear her side of it, right? But she would come up here and say the same thing. Yeah, Ron is so much stronger in these areas and those areas. It's not about overpowering or dominating one another. It's learning where you're strong and where you're weak so you can come together in that covenant relationship. So when the Bible refers to the wife as the weaker vessel, let me give you the fill in the blank, the weaker vessel actually means a more fragile fabric. Now, some guys know this, and if you do, that's fine, right? Some guys don't. If you don't, that's fine. But as as an example, right, when guys, if you were to do laundry and, and, and wives, don't give them the answer. If you were to be at home and do laundry, and down in the basket was blue jeans and a silk dress. Would you wash them together? Why not? Different fabric. Different. The, the jeans would absolutely destroy the silk. Guys, at any moment, you have the power to destroy your wife. Physically, emotionally, with your words, you do. And, and even wives, right? Emotionally, physically, wives can even be uh, vitriol and destroy their husbands, their character, their, their security. We can. The Bible has noted here that we're two different fabrics. I'm just regular off-the-shelf blue jeans and Raina's silk. And I need to learn how to treat her as such. How do you do that? The Bible tells you and I to be tender. And this is for all of us, but it is for marriage. This is where the all of us comes back. For all of us, he says, show compassion So how how do you and I treat fabric differently? Show compassion. The word literally there means to feel with. Like get in their spot, understand them, right? And can I just say that 
that no one ever wins when both of you are blue jeans and you're trying to battle it out with heated arguments. And nobody ever wins when screaming and shouting. Nobody ever wins in, in demanding and pouting. Nobody ever wins in walking away and slamming doors. Somebody as well said, when you lose your temper, you lose. Like you've lost, right? So you and I need to learn how to be tender, show compassion. Here's the second one. He goes, for, oddly enough, for all of us and for marriages, he says to love as brethren, What does that mean to love his brother? It it means to be friends, friendship love. Probably one of the couples that you'll point to that you'll say you admire the most in marriage is because that one couple that says, we're like best friends. You've heard that before, right? That's literally scriptural. Here's the third one, be courteous. It means to love in the little things. Okay, anybody can love in the big things. Chocolates, flowers, birthdays, anniversaries. Anybody can do that. But it's learning how to love in the little things, little words, little moments, little actions, little thoughts, little conversations. The Bible says to be courteous. This is how you and I help carry the weight of the mission. Now, if you just take those three things alone, right? Let's just say you start there in your marriage. Would you not agree that in these times that we're living, would it not help the rest of the world to see a husband and wife being compassionate, living as friends, and loving in the little things? Just that alone would draw your attention to there's something different. You've got something that we don't and we want. Here's the last one, and I love this one. You and I have to provide keys to the inheritance. You and I have to provide. What is one of the reasons why we're married? We are to provide keys to the inheritance, Go back, if you will, to verse seven. Likewise, husband, live live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you. Here's the inheritance of the grace of life so that your prayers may not be hindered. Here's what I can tell you. Every person that is lost and every marriage that is struggling is looking for some form of grace. And every human heart that is struggling is praying for some kind of answer. Just trust me. You know that, right? And as a married couple, one of the ways that we live, believe it or not, is aliens. Like our, our marriage in Christ will look like aliens to others. They'll be like, well, why are you not going out to the bars at night? Why are you not doing this? Why are we not watching these shows You mean you guys actually study together? You mean you guys actually read the Bible together? You mean you guys pray together? You mean you're not making the the, the goal of your marriage for income and, 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 and status? And you're not, I mean, they'll literally look at your life and wonder, there's something different about you guys. And I wanna know what that is. The Bible says that when you and I, listen, come together, when husbands and wives are on the same page, When we turn the key of prayer, when we turn the key of partnership, when we turn the key of purpose, parenting, when we turn that key together, it unlocks the grace of life in each other individually, but collectively as a marriage partnership. And when that grace of life is unlocked, it is overwhelming to the world. They don't know what to do with it, but they know they want it. It's something different. So what are you and I to do? We are to be totally together. Our marriage is called to be totally together in prayer, in parenting, in partnership. Why? Aimed at the goal of completing each other. That's the goal. You didn't get married just and only because you're attracted to one another and you can see yourself spending your life with that individual. No, you were given to each other for each other, for the completion of each other. So when you do come together in those moments, it is an example to the lost world. Again, this blows my mind. This is more than a marriage seminar. Peter is saying, listen, persecution's coming. The world is gonna persecute you for your faith. And what one of the things they need to see in that type of world is a marriage that is given to Christ. Think about that. There's so many side notes I could preach on that, but we don't have time. One, how much God valued women in a culture that didn't value women. 
how God valued husband and wife in a culture that didn't value monogamy, even then in a culture that didn't uh, value sort of the role of the husband and the role of the wife, they were just seen as just sort of independent of each other, but yet together. There's so many things that God was stating in that example. Marriage is one of those tools that God uses in our current age to be a model of the gospel of Christ. Now, for those of us that may not be married or if you're not married, again, show compassion. Love as brethren. Be courteous. It applies to all of us. We're supposed to be a living and model example of the gospel in everything that we do. As I said in last week's Bible study, I'm a gospel plumber. I'm a gospel teacher. I'm a gospel doctor. I'm a gospel husband. I'm a gospel wife because we're a gospel marriage. Amen? Amen. 